we're, we're praying the scriptures, so I'm going to pray one of the scriptures. And we're going to learn about praying the scriptures. So I thought, well, let's, in our prayer time, do that. Lord God, as your word says in Colossians chapter 1, I thank you always, Lord, the Father of Jesus Christ. When I pray for this first B congregation, because I know of their faith in Christ Jesus and of the love they have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for them in heaven and that they've already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to us. All over the world, Lord, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among them since the day they heard of it and understood God's grace in all its truth. They learned it from Andy Betcher and Ken Gould and Sally Molino and Bob Holloway and pastors and teachers before them. All these dear fellow servants who have been faithful ministers of Christ on our behalf, Lord, for our sake, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that we can pray that, that I'm able to pray that 2,000-year-old prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed for the church in Colossae. I get to pray, Lord, right now as right and commendable, as true today, here, in this situation, as it was then and there. And I know that you desire have us pray in a way that you are, you are anxious and ready to fulfill it in our hearing. Father, we're going to pray one more verse of Scripture, Psalm 119, verse 18. Open our eyes to see the wonderful things in your word. Praying the Faith Book. How many of you remember this book uh, the Prayer of Jabez, about 10 years ago, mostly on this side in the back. Who has never heard of the Prayer of Jabez? So, raise your hands. Raise your hands if you've never heard of the Prayer of Jabez. All right. I should go to the closest one. There you go. Now you got the book. Read it. Share it with somebody else. Um, the Prayer of Jabez uh, is a prayer written by, or not written by, um, brought to us in this book by Bruce Wilkinson. Bruce Wilkinson says he has prayed the prayer of Jabez for 30 years and continues to do so every single day of his life, ever since he discovered it. And it comes from uh, the book of First Chronicles. And we're talking about praying the faith book, praying the scriptures, praying the Bible. And one way to do that is simply to take a prayer from the Bible and pray it like I did in my prayer. I changed the personal pronoun, so it was a prayer from me. Um, but some prayers you can take just as they are, and the prayer of Jabez is one of those you can take verbatim. And I want to read it, but I want to show you where it is in context with the larger passage. And so I'm going to have you read out loud here. In just a moment, we're going to put the scripture up on the screen, and you're going to read aloud uh, the part leading up to the, the prayer, and then I'll actually read the prayer. Um, and I'm not going to lead you. Do you read better together when there's a leader? Or, or can you just do it on your own? Leader. 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 Who's, who's, Nancy, you said that? So, Nancy, would you come and stand down here? And just stand right. Come on, Nancy. Come on. So everybody can see your new haircut. And it's going to be up on the screen. And you don't need a microphone or anything. Uh, and, and you'll need it. Everybody else read with her because this is, this is a reading together, okay? And so this is First Chronicles chapter 4 beginning at verse 3. Go ahead. I think I have glasses. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
just a little bit more. Just a little more. <laughs> that was the absolute. Yeah, give her a hand. Give her a hand. Welcome home, Nancy. That was the worst congregational meeting I've ever heard in my life. That was, that was just plain awful. Um, gosh, I don't know what your problem was. You know, where James like has a little pony. You know, if you've got somebody you know in your family who's having a child and they're struggling with a name, just go to this chapter right here. You know, has a little pony. It's scriptural, but nobody else today will have it. And so it'll be unique. Um, now, we're going to get to the prayer that follows that, right? And, and the reason I had to do that was uh, for a number of reasons. One, just because I knew it would be fun. Um, but, but also, to show you that we can miss things in Scripture, because that's the kind of text that if you're reading through the Bible, you might just scan over it, because you don't know how to pronounce maybe some of those names. Or it's the part that you'll leave out. It's not the part you're going to go and study and spend Time of, but you're going to miss some important things. Did you see in there what it said? These were the descendants of Hur, H-U-R, the firstborn of Ephratah, and father of Bethlehem. What do we always hear at Christmas time when Herod asked his wise guys to tell him where the baby king is going to be born? Um, o you Bethlehem Ephratah, right? Here's where those names come from. These people, they live there. It's named after them. Uh, Tekoa is in here. That's a land out of the Bible we hear, but it's because of these people. And I'm only hoping that the name uh, Heifer in there was not a female. Um, <laughs> that would be bad. Uh, but, but there are great things we can learn in these little texts. In fact, what we're going to learn from this is what comes next, because the next couple of verses really are just like highlighted. They just they almost lift themselves off the pages from what we just read, what we just read, that same kind of stuff comes after these couple of verses. But look at these next two verses, verses 9 and 10, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, and, and listen to what they say. Verse 9. Jabez was more honorable, and I'm reading this because it's easy. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, this is what his name means, I gave birth to him in pain. Pain and child. Verse 10. Jabez prayed. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel. And here's his prayer. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And look what it says after the prayer. And God granted his request. So we have a prayer here that's confirmed by Scripture and in Scripture that the prayer was heard and answered by God. And that God answered exactly how he prayed it. So Bruce Wilkinson, when he came across this, and then he writes the book and shares it with you, he's basically saying, pray this prayer in this way. Lord God, bless me. Now, a lot of us pray that way, but, but we're praying it selfishly. He's not praying it for himself. He's praying that for others. Lord, bless me and enlarge my territory. What does that mean? Uh, if, if you have a used car lot, that it will grow and get bigger. You could pray that way, but that would be selfish praying. Instead, let this be about the kingdom of God and your influence and impact on others for the kingdom of God in the world. Lord, bless me and expand my territory. What if we pray that as a church with that in mind? Lord, bless us and expand our territory. Help us to get beyond ourselves. Help us not to make it about us. Help us to make it bigger than we are for the sake of others and not just for ourselves. And so when we pray the scripture and even when we say bless me, it's not necessarily just about us. It can be for others. Let your hand be with me. What, what a great prayer is that? In other words, God, guide me. God, be with me. God, go alongside of me. And keep me safe from harm so that I'll feel no pain. Lord, as we do this, as we advance your kingdom, keep us safe. Put your angels around us so that we can continue to do it. What a way to pray the scriptures. And then right after that, it goes back to all of those names 
of people. Nancy will never speak out loud in church again. <laughs> Are you a self-centered, pragmatic prayer? A believer who thinks of God more as a Santa Claus than as a sovereign, heavenly Father. Does your praying have more in common with programming a heavenly computer than it does to surrendering to a loving Master? Do you claim God's promises for your own ease rather than being claimed by God's promises for the purpose of His kingdom? Praying through the Bible will do three things for us at least. It will yield a mind informed by the will of God. A heart inflamed with the love of God for others. And hands extended in the service of God. All three of these things are central to uh, a balanced Christian life. And they are exactly who we claim to be as a church. The church with heart. Because the church with heart has three components. And we encourage everybody as the church with heart to be a part of all of these three things. It will yield a mind informed by the will of God was the first thing. And the first part of being the church with heart says um, that we love God with what? All of our heart, soul, and mind, right? And strength. Um, and we love God primarily through worship, which is the great commandment. And so our mind uh, gets in, informed and transformed. And then we have a heart inflamed with a love for God and others. And that second part of the church with heart is that we love one another primarily through small groups, and this is the great commitment. And the last part of that uh, is that we'll have hands extended in the service of God, and the third part of the church with heart is loving all people, primarily through ministry and mission, hands extended in service for God, and that's the great commission. So as we learn to pray the Bible, it helps us to be, to fulfill who we say <coughs> We are. So what's involved in praying the scriptures? How do I do that? Well, first of all, number one thing is that praying the scriptures requires us to read the scriptures. To read the scriptures regularly. Uh, we can't spit them out if we don't take them in. Uh, we can't regurgitate them if we don't swallow them. We are to feast upon God's word. So that's the very first thing. We can't hide his word in our hearts if we're not lingering in its pages. Martin Luther said, we need the gospel every day because we forget the gospel every day. Right? And haven't I said to you before that the, the only thing I do in pre preaching is I never tell you anything new. I never tell you anything new. Unless you never have to have heard it before. But I only tell you the scriptures. I'm only reminding you of what you already know. That's my job. It's not to come up with something new is to remind you of what's in His Word. This table right here that we're going to participate in a little bit, what's its purpose? Jesus said, as often as you do this, do so what? It's a reminder. And so we need the Gospel every day because we forget the Gospel every day. Reading the Bible is a reminder. If you've read through it, you say, ah, been there, done that, read that book. Got check that off the bucket list. No, because what happens? Have you ever read a verse of scripture uh, at some point in your life, and then you read it again at some other point in your life, and it means something totally different to you? The word hasn't changed. You have your lens, your perspective, your reading. Because you know now, maybe your children are grown and gone. Maybe uh, your spouse has passed away. Maybe uh, you got a different job. Whatever it is that you're seeing it through a different lens. And it's speaking differently to you than it did at a different place in your life. But the Word of God is still true. It's active and sharp, which we'll look at that text in just a moment. And don't only really read the Bible, but let the Bible read you. If we aren't careful, we can read the Scriptures for information and inspiration, which isn't a bad thing. But we can kind of play dodgeball with our calling to transformation. Having the Scriptures read us deepens our prayer life. And we'll see some examples of that as we go along. Now, you can take just any prayer in the Bible and re-pray it, but let's not limit ourselves just to the prayers 
in the Bible. In fact, I would believe that when you're reading your Bible, you ought to have a pen handy, or if it's electronically, however you take notes or highlight or underline in, in whatever format that is. Um, and that whenever you come across a prayer in the Scripture, you ought to highlight it or underline it so that you can go back and find them. I showed you a Bible once that I had all kinds of color coding stuff I did in it. One of those things was prayer. I went through just looking for all the prayers in the Bible and highlight them so I could go and just find those colors and, and be able to find them. But that's not all. There are many scripture texts, not the ones that you read together. I don't think that lends itself very well to prayer. Uh, but there are many, particularly the Psalms, uh, but, but also just verses that just are, you're able to lift off the pages of scripture and use as a prayer. Let me read you our actual text for today. And this, this is why I had Paul read all those short scriptures to you about God's word being fulfilled. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1 beginning in verse 9. The Lord reached out his hand and he touched my mouth. That's significant. And he said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. You know, his word is like bread, isn't it? It's, it's something for us to eat, something for us to feast upon, something. Uh, in fact, Jesus said, blessed is he who, what, hungers and thirsts after righteousness, who will take his word in. So, I put my words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot, to tear down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? Well, I see a branch of an almond tree. The Lord said to me, you see correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. All I want you to get are those last ten words. I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. God is saying to Jeremiah, and I believe God is saying to us, I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. So if you're praying... God's word, he's watching for it to be fulfilled. Just like the um, prodigal son, when he turned around, what? The father was already watching for him. He saw him for a long distance off. When you begin praying the scriptures, God already sees you. He's already watching and waiting to fulfill that scripture in your life, that prayer in your life. Now, would you like your prayers to, to be more powerful? To, to be more full of um, faith? Then pray the scriptures. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And here's, here's where it reads you. It reads me. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. See, the Bible's reading me right now. Instead of me reading it. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. When we speak and pray the scriptures, we're coming into alignment, into tune, into agreement with God. And His power is released in answering our prayers because He's able to fulfill it. There is a power released in the spoken word. I don't know why or how that happens. But God spoke, let there be light, and there was light. When He spoke it, it came into being. There is something about doing, saying our prayers out loud. And, you know, Jesus even talked about having a prayer closet. Why is that? That's so you can have a place where nobody else is around. You can pray out loud without fear of anybody else hearing, but you and God. But praying out loud is for us more than it is for God. When we pray out loud, we know that we have prayed. That's why we have this prayer room for you to go into. Because I can tell you how often I stand here and think, I know so-and-so has a prayer need. I know how blessed they would be if they would just walk into Just the act of walking and then hearing somebody else pray out loud for you releases this power for you from God. That doesn't, yeah, you can pray just within your head and so forth, but when you pray out loud, you know you've prayed. You know you've prayed. In fact, didn't Jesus sometimes say, Father, I'm basically saying this out loud, not for myself, but for those who are hearing me, so that they will know what you're doing. Okay, it's not to take away from praying silently. But test it. 
Test it. Test the prayer closet. And in fact, one of the best places when you're alone in the car because nobody else is, is around, um, just keep your eyes open. While you're driving, you're praying. Uh, pray out loud. Well, how do you pray the scriptures then? You have to read them. You have to know them. Do they always have to be verbatim? No. It might just be the principle of the scripture. Maybe you feel like God doesn't hear your prayers or maybe you don't know what to pray in certain situations. Uh, 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything, listen to this, according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that what we've, uh, what we've asked of Him, He will do. Uh, people take those scriptures out of context and just say, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. Right? Keep that part in there. Ask whatever you want according to His will. How do you know His will? I always say, God, knowing God's will best is seen in the rearview mirror. Right? We look back at our life and go, oh, that was God's will. It's, it's much harder for us to know it in the present, except in this, from His Word. If it's in His Word, we know it's His will, because He's the one who spoke it. So we pray those words, and He is ready, watching to fulfill it. 1 John 5.14 tells us that we have this confidence in God. Not only does He hear our prayers, but He also promises to answer them when we pray in line with His will. It says He hastens to perform His word. Benefits of praying the Scriptures uh, increases our spiritual growth because we're learning the Scriptures more. Uh, we're, we're praying more regularly. We actually learn what God says about certain situations. By praying His Word and looking for the results. And this is what I love, uh, is when God gives me a little serendipitous moment. Last night, uh, Scripture text verses came to me. Why? Because I've read it before, so it could come to mind. But it's a perfect conclusion for today's message, which I'll get to in just a moment. Uh, and, and when it came to me, I thought, why did I, why did I not think of that sooner? Why didn't that come to me earlier? Well, because I think God wanted me to be mindful of uh, experiencing exactly what I'm talking about. That situations come up in life, and for us, if it's a temptation, uh, or whatever it is that, uh, something difficult, how do we stand firm against it except by God's Word? That we can claim God's Word in it, or against it, or however it's needed. But we can only do that if we know it. And in this case, I would happen to know this one. I don't know all of it all of the scriptures, but I happen to know this one that you'll see in a few moments, at least I think, is the perfect text to conclude in a few moments. Before I get to that, on the other side of this wall, in the prayer room, there are four plaques arranged nicely on the wall together. They all have scripture verses on them, and they're all things that we can pray. So for those of you who have never been in the prayer room, this will be a benefit to you. For those of you who have or who go in there, you can go and stand by this wall and look at these prayers, and you can turn them into your own prayers. Jeremiah 29. I mean, who wouldn't want to pray this prayer? All I'm going to do again is change the personal pronouns. For you know the plans you have for me, Lord. Plans to prosper me and not to harm me. Plans to give me hope. And a future. I mean, isn't that already a prayer that you'd like to pray? I will call upon you and come to you and pray to you. Now the scripture's starting to read me. And I will listen to you. I will seek you, Lord, and I will find you when I seek you with all of my heart. That is directly out of Jeremiah 29 11. What a great prayer! Matthew 19.26 is over there as well. God, I'm in this situation, and to me, it just seems impossible. In fact, with me, Lord, it is possible, but with you, all things are possible. That's scripture. It's a prayer. Philippians 4.13, what's it say? You can do all Somebody things tell through me. Christ who strengthens me. They can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you, Paul. Did anybody else know that? I know some of you knew that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But kind of like asking for that tithing thing, you don't like public speaking. Or because I had Nancy come up here, you were scared. <laughs> and I weren't going to respond because you didn't know what might happen. That's a prayer. 
exactly those words. You don't even have to change the personal pronoun. There's a tough situation you go through. You're just you're you're at your wit's end. You don't know what else to do, and you simply say out loud, "I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me." That's a prayer. You released it to God, and He's sitting there watching to fulfill it in you, and His strength comes in to you. What a great prayer! Matthew six nine. This is the last one over there. Um, this then is how you should pray: Our Father in heaven, holy is Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. No, 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 no. It doesn't say that. Does it? It doesn't say that. That's a doxology that somebody added on to the end of it. The scripture actually ends with, but deliver us from the evil one. We deliver us from evil, right? Um, but we are so used to, those of us who have grown up in church, uh, are so used to saying that way. But that's a cool doxology. And it's very scriptural sounding. In fact, I'm not sure it may be exactly from scripture somewhere else. Um, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I mean, could you end every prayer with that? Whatever it is you pray, then you say, for yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, reminding you, right? It's reading you now, reminding you of who he is, and who you're praying to, and that he's the one that can answer. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Who? That, that's praying a, a, something scriptural. I mean, those words are certainly in scripture. Uh, whether they're exactly like that or not, I don't know. Um, but there's the Lord's Prayer as well. And then here's that conclusion part. You know what came to me last night? It's, I love this. Because uh, this is actually one of my, my favorite parts of Scripture. In fact, uh, I wanted to hear it this morning because I wanted to make sure it was fresh, but I wasn't just totally going from memory. And so while I was tying my tie this morning, I went over to my phone and turned it on, uh, went to YouVersion Bible, and hit speaker on Matthew 4 because that's where this text is found. Uh, and listen to it. Here's a, here's a great thing about this modern technology. The Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 4 to 6, for those of you who don't know, right? Matthew 4 to 6. And uh, when it got done with Matthew 5, I thought it was going to stop. I always thought it stopped at the end of the chapter. It doesn't. It just kept going. Chapter 4. And so I just took the phone, put it in my little phone holster, went and got my car, and I'm driving. And so the rest of the way to the church, I hear the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. How cool, what a great way to get scripture into us, to use these modern technology things. Uh, you know, I can plug that into the speaker in my, on my radio in my car, which I do sometimes, and just listen to his word. But here it is, here it is. Uh, Matthew 4. Uh, Jesus prayed the scriptures. That's what this is all about. I, why didn't I even think to question that? Why didn't I think about when I'm preaching this? Why didn't I ask, oh, did Jesus pray the scriptures? He's our great example. Did he pray the scriptures? Well, he did many times, actually, but this is right at the beginning of his ministry. In fact, last week I talked about the first 40 days, Jesus is baptized, and then he disappears from everybody. Right? He goes out in the wilderness to fast. To fast is not about just denying yourself. It's about what you're doing while you're denying the other thing. So he denied himself food. So what? So that he could meditate on God's word and pray and be in communion with the Father. Wait a minute. Did he take a bunch of scrolls out there with him? No. How did he meditate on God's word for 40 days without having the Bible with him? Oh, he knew it. Did God just give it to him? No. He studied the scriptures as he grew up. That's how he had it. Jesus had to do it just like we have to do it. And so for those 40 days, he's not eating and he's meditating on God's word the words that he has in his memory. And at the end of those 40 days, three huge temptations come to him, and he has these scriptures within him to pray out loud against the evil one. End of that prayer, we just pray the Lord's Prayer, right? And because of that, he can face the temptation. So what happens is, Satan shows up, Jesus had not eaten for 40 days, 40 nights, he's hungry. Satan says, hey, take these stones and turn them into bread. Jesus has got to be thinking, you know, that's a pretty good idea. That, that's a great miracle. I, I'm hungry. Here's stones. I'm out in the middle of the desert. There's no other food. I could just do that. 
But then he prays God's word right in front of Satan. It is written. It is written, praying God's word. Man will live by bread alone. Not, or man will not live by bread alone. Right? Man will not live by bread alone. But what? By every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that just reemphasizes what we're talking about. By every word that comes from the mouth of God. He, he says that out loud. He prays that out loud as a temptation barrier to get Satan away from him. Then Satan takes him to the temple and he takes him up to the highest point of the temple, the pinnacle. And uh, they're looking down at these uh, scraggly rocks down below and Satan says, Jesus, cast yourself down for as it is written. Now Satan's using scripture, right? You know what? If Satan knows scripture, we better know scripture. Because he's using power right now against Jesus. Right? He's using the power of the word of God against Jesus. He says, cast yourself down for it is written... He will send his angels concerning you, lest you even strike your foot against the stone. Jesus, praying out loud again. Ah, but it is also written, you will not put the Lord your God to the test. Don't use that word against me, because I know it too, and I'm getting it right back at you, right? We can only do that against temptation if we know it. And then finally, he takes Jesus up to a very high mountain. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Because this is Satan's domain now, right? At this point. Yeah. He says, look, Jesus, I will give you all of this, all of these kingdoms, if you'll simply bow down and worship me. Get away from me, Satan, for it is written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Whew. Satan went away. Yeah, amen. Look at the power that Jesus had. It wasn't because he was God's son. It was because he had God's word. Because he had God's word, he could speak it against temptation. And the one way he knew it was because he had gone to synagogue. Because he had gotten the scrolls out. Because he had read them, he had learned it. Don't at that point give Jesus more credit than yourself. That he wants us to do what he did. Right? What would Jesus do? Remember that? What would you do? Learn the scriptures even as Jesus did. Lord, I just want to bow before you right now and thank you for your word. I want to thank you that Jesus showed us the example of praying the scriptures. Lord, I know there's, there's prayers in there we can just lift off and pray. And God, not every one of them does apply to us. They're not going to be fulfilled if they're, if they're not meant for us. But Lord, we can discern that as we read your word. But Lord, there's also so much else in there that are written as prayers that can be taken off the pages and used as prayer, even as Jesus did. And we know that you are watching and, and wanting to fulfill your word. And, and, and our prayers, Lord, can become so much richer, so much fuller, fuller of your power, so much more able to release the Spirit because it is your word. We can't deny that. It's just truth. We'll know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Lord, that's not written as a prayer. But Lord, I'll know the truth. The truth knowing the, the, the truth is Jesus Christ. I'll know Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ will set me free from sin. Lord, that's praying the scriptures, and I thank you for it. I thank, we, thank you that we can know you through the scriptures. And that we can be reminded of how to pray and who you are even through this table that we're coming to right now in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we are coming to the table now. The servers can come. This table does not belong to this church, to the leadership here. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And he invites you to participate if you are his follower. The way we will participate in this meal today is that we will serve the bread first until everybody has received. And then in like manner with the cup. Servers, if you'd come as we pray over this table. Lord, right now, it is your word that tells us 
that we ought to do this in remembrance of you. And so, Lord, we're praying that today we do this meal, we partake of this meal in remembrance of you. We partake of this meal because we've come in here today with sin in our heart and our mind, and we need it forgiven, Lord, and this reminds us that you want to forgive our sins, that you are faithful and just to do so. Amen. When Jesus met with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and said, this is my body given for you to serve the people. Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who 
who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, one of those prayers, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's what this closing song is based upon. So we're going to pray those words to God through the song together. If you respond by going to the prayer room, it is open. Stand and sing together.